Welcome to the University of Washington Bronchoscopy Training Video, the Pneumothorax Module. Here we will review risk factors for pneumothorax and ways to minimize that risk, how to recognize when a pneumothorax has developed, including radiographic and ultrasound findings, and how to manage this complication, including non-invasive and procedural techniques. Pneumothorax occurs most commonly following transbronchial biopsies, with reported rates as low as less than 1% or up to 6% in some studies. Even when performed correctly, visceral pleura may be disrupted. Cases have been reported of pneumothorax following bronchoscopy with BAL alone, or even airway inspection. This is rare, but more likely in intubated patients, due to higher airway pressures when the bronchoscope is obstructing the endotracheal tube. When performing transbronchial biopsies, the risk of pneumothorax is higher with repeated biopsies. Know the diagnostic yield of biopsies in any given case to balance the risk of complications with the increased likelihood of diagnosis with each biopsy. A coughing or uncooperative patient is likely at higher risk because it may be difficult to control the depth of the forceps. Ideally, patients will be sedated enough to be calm, but able to cooperate with breathing instructions and to signal if they feel sharp pain that may indicate impending pleural injury. In that case, you should open the forceps, allow the patient to inhale, then close and withdraw to try again. Fluoroscopy has not been demonstrated in the literature to effectively decrease the risk of pneumothorax, but many providers use it in part to help them identify when their forceps are far extended close to the pleura. Finally, many providers feel that using an aggressive biopsy technique in which the forceps are quickly and forcefully withdrawn can increase the risk of pneumothorax. Again, this is subjective rather than data-driven, but most providers agree a more gentle pull provides adequate yield with less risk. Pneumothorax can occur during or immediately after a bronchoscopy, but commonly presents later, sometimes up to two hours after the procedure. When they are large enough to cause symptoms, patients may develop dyspnea, cough, and sometimes chest discomfort and hypoxemia, all varying by degree depending on how large the air collection and how severe the underlying pulmonary limitation. Pneumothorax has traditionally been diagnosed by chest x-ray or fluoroscopy if it is immediately available. Many providers and institutions include a post-procedure x-ray. However, because clinically relevant pneumothoraces are generally apparent by symptoms, British Thoracic Society guidelines do not recommend routine chest x-ray after bronchoscopy, and there is published data to support this approach. For small pneumothoraces, bedside ultrasound is more sensitive than radiography. Normal apposition of the two layers of the pleura is seen on the ultrasound screen as lung sliding or gliding. When this interface is interrupted, for example by air, visceral pleura movement is no longer detected and lung sliding is not present. While the presence of sliding absolutely rules out pneumothorax at the location of the transducer, keep in mind that the absence of lung sliding is not specific for pneumothorax. Anything that impedes the normal movement of the two layers of pleura will abolish lung sliding. In its most severe form, pneumothorax may cause tension physiology, in which air continues to accumulate to the point at which intrathoracic pressure impedes venous return, leading to cardiac collapse. Tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis. When a patient develops severe dyspnea and hypoxemia with tracheal deviation on exam and or progressive hypotension, do not wait to confirm the diagnosis radiographically, but move directly to emergent decompression. We'll talk about that in a moment. Even for smaller pneumothoraces, if you suspect this complication, you should stop the procedure if it is still underway, administer additional oxygen, listen for breath sounds, and if patient status allows, confirm the diagnosis with imaging. As discussed earlier, ultrasound can help you rule out pneumothorax if sliding lung is present throughout the hemithorax. To confirm a pneumothorax, fluoroscopy is fastest if it is in the room, or call for a portable chest x-ray if the patient is clinically stable. While most cases of small pneumothorax after bronchoscopy can be managed with supplemental oxygen and observation alone, it pays to be ready to intervene if needed. Patients with a large pneumothorax on imaging 
Severe dyspnea or hypoxemia or hypotension require direct treatment. You should know where to find the materials you need to perform emergency chest decompression and how to place a small bore chest tube. With tension physiology causing hypotension or severe hypoxemia, you must perform emergent decompression. The fastest, simplest approach is to take the largest diameter angiocatheter you can find and insert it into the chest. Traditionally, this is done at the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line, but published data suggests the fourth or fifth intercostal space in the anterior axillary line may have a lower failure rate because the chest wall is thinner at this site. This is in the triangle of safety bounded by the lateral aspect of the pectoralis muscle, the medial border of the latissimus dorsi, and the fifth intercostal or nipple line, inferior mammillary crease in women, with the apex in the axilla. If you decompress the pleural space, you should hear a rush of air and see immediate hemodynamic improvement. Keep in mind, a simple needle or angiocath allows air into the chest as well as out. You can create a one-way valve by cutting a finger from a sterile glove or using an impromptu water seal system, but ultimately needle decompression is not a definitive solution. It may not be possible to reach the pleural space in obese or muscular patients, and even with proper positioning, flexible catheters can kink and won't be effective for long. A dedicated emergent pneumothorax kit like this one has a longer armored catheter that is less likely to kink and a true flutter valve to allow air out of the chest but not in. Insert the catheter and needle into the chest until a rush of air is heard. Or, if you have a moment to put a few cc's of saline into a syringe, pull back on the plunger as you advance the needle until bubbles freely flow into the syringe. This indicates you've reached the free air in the pleural space. Then advance the needle and catheter together at least a few extra millimeters to ensure the catheter itself enters the pleural space before advancing the catheter until it is hubbed and withdrawing the needle. Attach the flutter valve via the included flexible tube, making sure the valve is oriented the correct way, and the stopcock is open to let air escape. The catheter can be secured with a soft flange or taped in place. The tubing can also be connected to wall suction, but keep in mind this is not a good option for longer management. Once the patient is stabilized, you should place a more definitive catheter. Surgical chest tubes are one such option, but for most pneumothoraces, percutaneous chest tube kits like this one allow rapid placement of a small tube, in this case 14 French, using Seldinger technique, much like a central venous catheter. First, prepare your kit. Insert the trocar to stiffen the flexible catheter and secure at the base. Though not demonstrated here, some operators like to use a small amount of saline over the catheter as a lubricant. Lay out the items you will use in the order you will need them. Position the patient supine with the arm secured overhead. Review your anatomy and choose an insertion site in the triangle of safety at the superior aspect of the rib to avoid the neurovascular bundle. At this point, some providers will use ultrasound to ensure they do not see sliding lung at this intercostal space, which would indicate the visceral and parietal pleura are in apposition at this location. In other words, the pneumothorax is not present at this location. Ultrasound can also tell you the thickness of the subcutaneous tissue along the anticipated insertion track, so you know how long a needle you will need to use and how deep to insert it before you expect to see air. Use lidocaine with epinephrine to make a small wheel using a 25 gauge needle, then a larger needle to anesthetize liberally along the anticipated track, aiming cephalad to enter the pleural space over the top of the rib. Just as you would with a central line, pull back on the plunger as you advance the needle until bubbles freely flow into the syringe. Note how deep the needle is inserted so you know how far you need to insert your dilator later. In a stable patient, Pull back a few millimeters and inject extra lidocaine to the parietal pleura before advancing the needle back into the pleural space. This step can make a big difference for patient comfort. Remove the syringe and feed the wire through the needle until there is about 10 centimeters left. Remember, your needle should be oriented cephalad so the wire will feed toward the lung apex. Remove the needle and make a one centimeter incision by inserting the scalpel to its hub.
Insert one dilator the necessary depth based on how much subcutaneous tissue you estimated by ultrasound and then confirmed by needle depth. Slide the dilator in and out a few times using a twisting motion to ensure it moves freely. Then remove it and feed the catheter with trocar in place over the wire. Push the catheter, trocar, and wire as a unit until at least the first black line. Then you can advance the catheter the rest of the way while holding the trocar and wire still or removing them at the same time. There is no absolute rule to insertion depth other than you must ensure all the holes in the catheter are well within the pleural space. When the wire is out, attach the flutter valve or connect the tubing to a collection device such as this atrium. Secure the tube with suture at skin with a knot and around the tube using tails before dressing with gauze and tape. Obtain a chest x-ray to ensure good apical placement. Most pneumothoraces from bronchoscopy will not require prolonged chest tube drainage. Once the lung is fully reinflated, the tube can be placed to water seal and a chest x-ray repeated a few hours later to ensure air does not reaccumulate.